Right, I'm feeling a little bit busy with um, models this week because since we've been talking about the face the last couple of weeks and we've been talking about the muscles of facial expression and the facial nerve, cranial nerve 7, that innervates those muscles of facial expression, I thought really, before we move on, we should talk about the sensory aspects of the face because here we get to talk about cranial nerve 5, the trigeminal nerve, and to do that I need lots of different models because lots of different models show lots of different things. So the plan is to start from the brain stem very briefly and then talk about how the trigeminal nerve gets out of the skull and the trigeminal nerve has three major branches and you can think about those three major branches as then each having another three smaller branches which then have smaller branches, that's how branching works right? Um, but then they um, innovate different regions of the face so we'll follow those nerves out, we'll see where they go, we'll talk about some of the foramina and talk about how those nerves get where they're going but the point we'll, we'll get to is we'll be able to talk about um, branches of the trigeminal nerve innervating different regions of the face and why. How you can test for that and then we'll talk about trigeminal neuralgia. Alright? Now, trigeminal, think about the word, right? Gemini, you know Gemini. Gemini uh, refers to the twins, that constellation in the sky. Um, it's a Latin word. It refers to the Greek twins, uh, Castor and Pollux. Um, so Gemini means twins, so trigeminal uh, or trigeminus or trigemini means triplets, uh, three born at the same time. So that's all the trigeminal nerve is, it just means three at the same time, all right? Trigeminal. Cool, huh? So here's my brain model, the one that always <laughs> falls apart, right? Let's take the blood vessels off. <laughs> it's because it's upside down, I always want to turn it over so it's the right way around, but when I do that, it's fine, it's absolutely fine. Someone's left an earring there. Um, right, come on, you got this. The trigeminal nerve then is ooh, this large branch here and here on either side. So you can see that it's kind of appearing um, more posteriorly than some of the other cranial nerves and it's, it's quite a big one, it's a big nerve. Now the reason the trigeminal nerve is a big nerve is that it's, it is the major sensory nerve of the face and the scalp and of course your face is very sensitive. You've got like really high resolution sensitivity in your lips and your eyes and you know, your cheek everywhere, right? So if you're going to have a high resolution of sensitivity then you're going to need a lot of neurons to carry the information from all of those sensory receptors. So the, the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5, is a big nerve because it has a lot of neurons in there. And in fact if we look at um, where it comes from. So if we look within the brain stem, so we've got ooh, midbrain, pons, medulla here. Mo it, it comes from mostly um, some very long somatic sensory nuclei, which, which extend through the midbrain, sorry, yeah, extend through the midbrain, the pons, the medulla, and even into the upper parts of the spinal cord. Um, so it has a lot of nerve cell bodies in there. Um, and it does have a motor component as well, it's motor to the muscles of mastication in a couple of other bits. Um, so it has some motor nuclei in there as well, but that's where trigeminal nerve 5 comes from, that's where the cranial, the cranial nerve comes out from. Ooh, if we grab big head, <coughs> big head's cooler, big head is showing some of those muscles of mastication and the muscles of facial expression, but if we if we turn big head around and we look inside the cranial cavity, do you see where we are? Uh, all right. This is where the pituitary gland would be. There's the internal carotid artery. So this is the sphenoid bone here. Um, and this is, this, is the, this is anterior here, right? So there, that 
is the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5. This lump here is the trigeminal ganglion, and from the trigeminal ganglion, we then get these three branches of the trigeminal nerve. These are the ophthalmic, the maxillary, and the mandibular branches. The ophthalmic and maxillary branches are purely sensory, uh, the mandibular is sensory and motor. That's the one carrying the, the motor fibres to the muscles of mastication. Now we can also, um, so we can use some different nomenclature for these branches. So we would write in Roman numerals CNV for cranial nerve 5. Um, and then for the first branch, we might write CN V and then 1 in subscript. And that would refer to the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. Uh, we could then write CN V2, and that would be for the maxillary branch. And then for the mandibular branch, we could write CN V3. So you might see that as well, and that refers to these three major branches. And these three major branches go into three different regions of the face but they've got to get through the bones of the skull to get out there. Now the ophthalmic branch is going to run into the orbit and between the orbit and this cranial fossa we have we have that slit, we have the superior orbital fissure and that's where the ophthalmic branch of uh, the trigeminal nerve goes through. It goes through the superior orbital fissure along with a lot of other nerves that are innervating the muscles of the orbit that move the eye uh, and so on. So the trigeminal nerve is the major sensory nerve of the face and by face I kind of mean this region here and it goes well the sensory innervation go covers the scalp uh, but it doesn't go all the way back. It covers the scalp and the top of the head to about there. It covers the face on either side as far back as the, the oracle, the external ear, and about the jawline. And then it overlaps with um, the cervical plexus, so cutaneous nerves from um, cervical spinal branches coming out of the spinal cord, right, spinal nerves. Um, the cervical plexus then innervates the skin kind of from the jawline and then down through the neck and then also posterior to the ear and the back of the head. Um, we'll talk about the German terms later maybe, but C2 and C3 kind of do that, right? So there's some overlap between the trigeminal nerve and the cervical plexus, the cervical spinal nerves. And of course, like with most nerves, most of these um, kind of areas overlap a little bit. Um, so it's, and everybody's a little bit different. So, you know, the pictures you see might not be the same for everybody. Right, I'm going to I'm going to bang into some detail and then pull back out again, right? I'm going to bang into some detail just to just to explain how, where the nerves run and then we'll kind of like uh, do an overview. Now, each of these three major branches of the trigeminal nerve um, they then split again, generally described into three. So the, the ophthalmic nerve has passed into the orbit by going through the superior orbital fissure, so it's now in the orbit, and then it splits again, it's going to split into the frontal nerve, the lacrimal nerve, and the nasociliary nerve. And those are going to go to different places. If we take the frontal nerve first, the f okay, frontal, yeah, frontal bone, frontal lobe, frontal part, the frontal nerve then is essentially going to come up here. The frontal nerve is going to split into uh, supratrochlear and supraorbital nerves. Now, supraorbital is fairly sensible, right? Here's the orbit. Now up here, there's a little groove. Sometimes it's a foramen, sometimes it's a groove. And this is where the supraorbital nerve, it, so it, it runs like through the orbit and then get, gets through the bone here and pops out to run up into this region here. So we can innovate the frontal part of, of the scalp. So that's the, that's the supraorbital branch of the ophthalmic branch. And that's what we're seeing here, right? But you can see there's another nerve right next to it. And that's the supratrochlear nerve or the supratrochlear branch of the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. Joy, huh? Right, so that, and that's essentially going to the same place and doing the same thing. And I'll explain why it's called supratrochlear in a moment. But then we've got the, um, the nasociliary nerve. 
So that nasociliary branch of the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve, sorry, splits into anterior ethmoidal and posterior ethmoidal branches and into the um, infratrochlear nerve. Now the ethmoid bone is in the middle here, right? It's the medial wall of the orbit and it's also the upper part of the nasal cavity. Um, and the terminal branch of the inter, sorry, of the anterior ethmoidal nerve is the external nasal branch. Uh, and what I'm saying is that that branch gets to the skin here in the middle of the nose, right? Running up the length of the nose. So the nasociliary nerve carries some sensory innovation from here. Now those other branches, they go to the conjunctiva of the eye. Um, you know, the, the covering of the eye, you know, the, the, yeah, the, li the, the lining, the sensitive bit. Um, and they also, some of those branches are going to go into the nasal cavity and carry sensory innovation from the nasal mucosa. Now the reason that, that, that we have the supratrochlear branch and the infratrochlear branch is we're in the eye, right? There is more anatomy per cubic centimetre in the orbit than anywhere else in the body. So it's not my fault, it's just complicated. Now, the eye. We have a number of muscles that move the eye within the orbit. These are the extraocular muscles. And most of them are straightforward. I don't know if you've looked at these before, but, but this muscle here, so we have a muscle, so this is the midline here, this is lateral in the nose here, but we have the um, superior oblique muscle. And it does a bunch of things. One of the things it does, it kind of rotates the eye, but it, yeah. Anyway, the superior oblique muscle is running this way, and then it's passing through a pulley and then running back to the eye. The pulley is the trochlea. That's, that's what trochlea means, it's a pulley, right? So this trochlea is here in this part of the bone of the orbit. So the supratrochlear nerve runs superior to the trochlea. The infratrochlear nerve is running inferior to the trochlea. All right? That's why they're named that way. I'm just trying to, so it makes a little bit more sense. It's not completely mad. We'll come back to the eye in the future. This hasn't got a lacrimal gland, but you know the... Oh, he has. So the lacrimal gland's up here, right? The lacrimal gland is up in the, the, uh, the superior lateral part of the orbit. This is what makes the tears. And then the, the, the third branch of the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve is the lacrimal nerve. And the lacrimal nerve just runs across the orbit, kind of around the orbit, to get out to the lacrimal nerve here. So it's going to carry sensory innovation from the lacrimal gland itself, but it's also going to carry sensory innovation from, you know, the upper eyelid and the, the skin in this region over here. Now the other thing that the lacrimal nerve does is it carries postganglionic parasympathetic neurons to the lacrimal gland. So those are the neurons that are motor to the lacrimal gland. They're the ones that switch it on and make the tears flow, but they're not from cranial nerve 5. They're not from the trigeminal nerve. They're from the facial nerve, cranial nerve 7. And those postganglionic parasympathetic neurons, they're just running with the lacrimal gland to get over here because that nerve's already going that way, right? So don't get confused. Um, the sensory stuff from here is in cranial nerve 5, but the, the nerve that makes you cry is the facial nerve, all right? So, in summary, the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve gives off three branches which run up here to the upper eyelid, to the conjunctiva of the eye, to the strip of skin on the nose here, and to some of the nasal mucosa. That's V1, all right? Okay, now what about the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve, V2, the second branch? All right, if we go back to big head, that's the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve. That then is the maxillary branch here. And you can see it dropping out through another bone in the skull. So if that's the superior orbital fissure there, running through there, then the hole next to it, the nice round hole, that's foramen rotundum. And that's where the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve runs. It gets out of the skull by passing through um, or rather, it gets out of the cranial cavity by passing through foramen rotundum. And that pops out, you can kind of just about see in there, deep, 
deep within the face, in the maxillary level, which is what you'd expect, because like this bone is the maxilla, the, this is the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve, that's where it's supposed to go, that's where it's supposed to go. Um, and this nerve, the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve, again, splits into three branches. We can see a couple of clues. There's another, right, there's another foramen there, and if I put a pipe cleaner through, you can see that it, it actually pops out within the orbit. Now what happens here is, there are three branches of the maxillary nerve, uh, and those are the zygomaticofacial, the zygomaticotemporal, and the infraorbital nerve. So if you've got a supraorbital nerve, you can have an infraorbital nerve, right? This is then the infraorbital foramen. And what happens is, is that the, um, these branches get back into the orbit by passing through the inferior orbital fissure and then they have to get out of the orbit again. So the, the infraorbital nerve pops out there, so it gets into the maxillary region and innervates the skin of, you know, the lateral nose, the maxilla, uh, the upper teeth, the upper lip, that sort of region there. Now the zygomaticofacial and zygomaticotemporal, well this is the zygomatic bone here, and the zygomaticofacial nerve, there is, there is a small zygomaticofacial um, foramen, I can just see a little tiny like, uh, indentation on this plastic skull here, but that pops out here, and then the zygomaticotemporal goes up here, um, and there's a little, there's a little, again, a little kind of uh, suggestion of a foramen here. Zygomaticotemporal nerve then gets up into the temporal region. So the zygomatico, um, where are we? So the zygomatico, uh, facial, I'm trying to feel where my face is. Um, so we've got, <laughs> do it on, should do it on the same side, shouldn't I? So there's the orbit, there's the orbit. All right, there's my zygomatic bone out here. Right, the infraorbital nerve runs inferior to the orbit and innervates this region here. The zygomaticofacial nerve um, kind of stays close to the orbit. Um, but over the zygomatic bone and the zygomaticotemporal actually gets into the temporal fossa, so it stays quite deep here, um, and then pops out, um, and then innervates the skin over the uh, kind of the, the anterior part of the temporal region here. So zygomaticofacial, zygomaticotemporal. So those are the three branches of the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve, and they innervate uh, 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 this this space here, right? Okay, good. Really, there's another bit. So the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve actually has a short zygomatic nerve, and that runs across the orbit and then splits into the zygomaticofacial and zygomaticotemporal branches. But is that helpful to remember? There's a sinus under here, right? I'm caught on. What am I caught on? Skeleton. Lego! Ah, uh, Lego! What? Why? Oh, right. Back off, man. What was I talking about? There's a sinus under the bone here, right? The maxillary sinus, which is lined with the mucosa. So the, the second branch of the trigeminal nerve, the maxillary nerve, is also carrying sensory innervation from the maxillary sinus in that region as well, right? It's, it, it's common sense, right? Okay, so the third branch then of the trigeminal nerve is the mandibular branch. And the mandibular branch is dropping down in theory. So it's gonna drop down here to get to these guys. So, in the skull, we see, we see the oval foramen, right? So the oval foramen, that's how the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve gets out. You can see where it's popping out there. So it's pretty deep in the face. And again, this is gonna give off three branches as well, kind of. Mm. Should I do this so it's like we're both on the same side? The auriculotemporal nerve, so we're already deep to the mandible. So the auriculotemporal nerve is a nerve, it's a branch of the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve that's deep to the ramus of the mandible, um, it's deep to the parotid gland, but it's going to find its way out to get up to this region here. So the auriculotemporal nerve is going to innervate the skin kind of around, 
around here, right? So anterior to the external ear, anterior to the oracle, um, kind of the posterior part of the temporal region, but not on the top, just kind of as far as that. So that's the auriculotemporal nerve. Um, and then we've got the buccal nerve, and the buccal nerve is going to find its way out to the cheek. In fact, the other week we were talking about the branches of the facial nerve, and there's a buccal branch of the facial nerve there, isn't there? Now, the buccal branch of the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve is sensory to the skin of the cheek and the oral mucosa on the other side, um, and it will actually often um, join with the buccal branch of the facial nerve, just because, again, these nerves are going to the same place. So during development, they just followed the same cues and they all went there together, right? Which is why we get mixed nerves. So that's the buccal branch down there. And then we have the mental nerve. Now the mental nerve, well, first of all, we have the inferior alveolar nerve. In the mandible down here, there's this canal here, right? Is this a real canal in this plastic? No, of course not. So this is, um, this is the mandible, so this is the mandibular canal. The inferior alveolar nerve, alveolar nerve runs into here. It's going to carry all the sensory innervation back from the teeth. And, from, um, and then the mental nerve is going to pop out through this foramen here, uh, the mental foramen, and innervate the, the skin of the, uh, the chin and the lower lip and what have you. That's a lot of wiring. That's probably way more information than most people need to know. But what it boils down to is that the, the first branch of the trigeminal nerve, the ophthalmic branch, innervates the skin of the scalp, of the top of the head, and the front here, and the eyelids, like that, and also the conjunctiva of the eyes. Uh, the second branch of the trigeminal nerve, the maxillary nerve, innervates the skin, covering the maxilla, the medial nose, uh, the upper lip, uh, and the skin beside the eye, the lower eyelid, part of the conjunctiva, um, and the skin of the anterior temporal region. And then the third branch of the trigeminal nerve, the mandibular branch, innervates the skin over the mandible and as far back as the, the oracle, the external ear, and what's remaining of the, of the temporal region. Um, and then if you remember that distribution, then you can add on the teeth uh, and the oral mucosa and that sort of thing. All right, that's what it boils down to. And that means that you can test the function in a patient by testing the different regions. So you can test the ophthalmic, sorry, this guy hasn't got any skin, but imagine he's got a skin, by um, using some light cotton wool or maybe you want to test for temperature or what have you. So you can test the first branch of the trigeminal nerve by testing sensation up here. You can then test the, the second branch of the trigeminal nerve by testing sensation around here. And you can test the third branch by testing sensation down here. And that's very, that's very useful. Um, just as with the other nerves of the face, um, these nerves are susceptible to trauma, um, you know, to lacerations, to fractures of the bone and that sort of thing. They're also susceptible to tumour and what have you as well. Now, there is a, there is a, a condition of somewhat peculiar to the trigeminal nerve, which is trigeminal neuralgia. And in trigeminal neuralgia, um, a patient might get um, like a sudden, excruciating pain of either one region of the face innervated by one branch of the trigeminal nerve or more than one. Um, and it can be random or they might have realized that there's a trigger point that if, if something touches that part of their face it, it kicks off this, this inappropriate uh, pain response from that region of the face. And this trigeminal neuralgia is usually caused by either one of those three main branches um, or maybe a little bit early, but often one of those three main branches is, has been damaged either by a tumour or a blood vessel, and then we get this uh, spontaneous switching on of that branch of the trigeminal nerve, completely inappropriately by something, which then causes a lot of pain. It can be treated somewhat pharmacologically, but it can be very difficult to treat, and surgical options are... Uh, Difficult, somewhat extreme, but there are some, you know, a lot of very skilled surgeons out there who know far more about this than I do. Um, and when we're thinking about dermatomes, then there aren't, hmm, um, you know, there aren't dermatomes in the traditional sense where we have the dermatome pattern of a, so nerves from a certain spinal level running peripherally from the spinal 
cord out to different regions of the body, we'll know that um, different patches of skin are innervated by nerves from different spinal levels, right? And we can use that dermatome map um, to diagnose what we think might be going on in a patient. Um, that's a little bit different in the head because most of this is innervated by cranial nerves, not spinal nerves. But essentially then, if you had a dermatome map, this would be V1, and then this would be V2, and then this would be V3. And as we get back to the ear, then the skin around here is innervated by um, C2 nerves, and then further down the neck, C3 and C4. There isn't a dermatome for, for the C1 spinal level. And uh, the one final thing um, to consider when we're talking about the trigeminal nerve is, of course, uh, the corneal reflex. So we saw that these nerves um, are innervating the, the conjunctiva, the, the covering, sensitive covering of the eyeball. Um, so with, um, with touch or pressure or temperature or, you know, the trigeminal nerve then is carrying the sensory afferent limb of that reflex, is carrying the sensory information back to the brain stem and then um, the reflex relay then triggers the facial nerve, cranial nerve 7, which we were looking at in recent weeks to cause orbicularis oculi to close and protect the eye. So that's the reflex there. Cranial nerve 5, sensory, cranial nerve 7, motor. Ta-da! Oh, blimey, that was, um, that was a lot of information. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm clever, I'll edit that down into something <laughs> concise and useful. But hey, there's just, there's just a lot of anatomy in the head and neck. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, th I thought it was useful that we, we finished that off because we've talked about the muscles of facial expression, we've talked about the muscles of mastication in the past, we've talked about the tongue, we've talked about all sorts of bits of the face. Um, and we've probably mentioned that the trigeminal nerve is sensory to the face. Just adding that detail on top lets you work out so much. Like the important things are the three main branches, but those other little nerves and the spaces they run through is not just interesting, um, it's important because you know, the, the orbit affects so much, right? And if you've got that information in the back of your head, even if you don't remember it all, then you might be able to draw it up, pull it back when you need it, when you're trying to work out what the heck is going on um, in this person's head. Right. Ooh, see you guys next week.